Good evening, everyone. Good evening, <clears throat> GANIC members. As you are coming in, we'll get started in just a few moments. We have our guest speakers here already. And welcome all. Everyone's safe and warm inside somewhere, I hope. And we finally got the driveway cleared, which was very nice. We have 15 plus inches out here where I am in Jersey. So it's a great lot of fun. Okay, I'm watching the numbers go up. So as usual, if you have um, any questions, we're going to, we'll be monitoring the chat, but for our speakers tonight, please use the question and answer uh, feature on Zoom, okay? And this record, this session is being recorded, so you'll be able to look at it later. So welcome everybody. The agenda is in our Google Drive. Hold on a moment. Um, Mike, if you could perhaps post the link in. I'm sorry, I'm trying to keep an eye on two million things. Um, so we're going to have two speakers tonight after the after I give you all some updates, and then we'll have our committee reports. So if you have any questions or anything else that needs to be addressed, please put that into, into the chat, and we'll get to that as well. So I'll wait a few more minutes, let a couple more people get in. We did have a nice full registration. So make sure everyone has a chance to, to come in. All right. So, okay. So we will, we're going to get started. Just go over the agenda quickly. Yes, everyone loves your background, Kelly. <laughs> Francis is in the library. Kelly is on top of the Duomo di Firenze, which is nice too. All right, two places I think all of us would love to be visiting very soon. Okay, so we're going to, um, I'll give my report, then we'll have our guest speakers, um, Francis Marone and Kelly Carroll. And Bill will be introducing them, and then we'll have our um, committee reports. So uh, for me, my, uh, my, my president's address is really just an update on some great things that are coming up and give you all some news about things that are coming up over the next month uh, and a couple of weeks as well. Now, uh, the big thing is uh, next week, actually on February 10th, we're going to have a session with, it's a new group, it's called Good for Guides. And this is something that I've been working on with members of the DC Guild uh, with Karen and Vaughn from IATDG and also with Mitch from Trip School. And Mitch is one of our industry partners and a GANIC member. So Good for Guides is a, a, this, this group here that we're working on um, ways to uh, make sure that guides, um, tour operators and, um, and tour directors are working together to, for the best for all, all, three, all three groups. And to, to that end, we're going to have a, an online conversation, a webinar on February 10th at 4 p.m. Okay, on February 10th at 4 p.m. And we will uh, be taking, you know, everyone is welcome to register for it. It's a free event. And let me just get the, get the link and put that in. Um, but it's at goodforguides.com very easy to find. And I posted already on our Facebook group. And I also, all of you should have received an announcement about that. So you're welcome to register for it. And Good for Guides, like I said, is going to be a, a way to dialogue among these groups and to discuss the issues that are important for these three, for tour guides, tour um, directors, and tour operators. So Vaughn and Mitch will be the moderators for the discussion. And um, we'll have the industry experts. So I really encourage all of you to come to that. That'll be on February 10th at 4 p.m. at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And the first focus on the first webinar will be on student travel. And we'll have another one uh, at a later date that will be more on general group travel. So I can, you can see I just put the link in there. Oops, hold on. I just put it to just the panelists. Let me make sure I get it to everybody. Sorry. 
Yeah, make sure everything's addressed to all panelists and attendees if you want everyone to be seeing it. Okay, so that's for good for guides, February 10th. The next thing that, um, the next program that's coming up that's a big, uh, more industry wide program is International Tourist Guide Day. So International Tourist Guide Day, if you, um, some of you may have attended it last year, we had it down at the Museum of the Chinese in America. Kevin Lawrence gave a wonderful Chinatown tour. Um, Derek organized a great happy hour, all of us together. And that was right when things were starting to go downhill. And so we went there to support Chinatown and to support um, visiting uh, in uh, visitors to New York. And that's what the scope of International Tourist Guide Day is. And that is always February 21st. That's the date that's set by the uh, World Federation of Tourist Guides Associations. And so we'll be having an event on February 21st uh, from noon to 3 p.m. There'll be more information and registration coming shortly. Michael Dillinger and I are working on this on behalf of the NFTGA, of the National Federation of Tourist Guides Associations. And um, Kelly and Francis, I'm sorry, you guys are getting all the initials. There are way too many initials when it comes to uh, these different professional associations. So um, the ITGD, uh, International Tourist Guide Day, um, it's really a fun event and it's actually worldwide. And so our event this year will be virtual, of course, and we'll be celebrating with other um, uh, associations from the National Federation. And what we're going to do is we're going to have two conversations, um, one with international tourist guides who will come and address us and speak about working with visitors from overseas to their respective countries. We're going to have a guide speaking from Italy, a guide from Turkey, a guide from the United Kingdom, and um, a guide from Costa Rica. So we'll have uh, four international tourist guides. And then for the United States, we'll have four guides who will speak about take, bringing international guests to their respective cities. And we'll have New York, uh, San Diego, and I'm sorry, San Francisco, Chicago, and Philadelphia will be speaking. They'll be represented. So we'll be talking about tourist guides as cultural ambas ambassadors, how we can change people's attitudes and ideas and preconceptions and misconceptions when they travel. And so to um, really have a, a fun dialogue and a fun way of sharing different tricks and techniques. And so tourist guides will be able to update you know, your fellow guides on, on things they do and ways they deal with visitors coming in who may have certain set ideas. I and mean, we know that a lot of people visiting New York have very specific ideas of what New York should be like based on you know movies or TV shows. And sometimes we have to sort of disabuse them of, of their misconceptions. And so there are ways of doing that. And so that's gonna be a fun discussion. So that will be on February 21st um, from 12 to three. And that's going to lead us into our awards show. And the awards ceremony, our organic Apple Awards will be on February 22nd. And the date was chosen to go along with International Tourist Guide Day. And Matt Baker will be giving us a lot more information about it. I hope you all have seen some of our wonderful presenters who will be coming. They're really to die for. It's gonna be a lot, a lot of fun. So, um, so that I will get more updated uh, we'll get updated from with Matt Baker when he speaks. And finally, in March, uh, look forward to on March 4th, 5th, and 6th, the World Federation, WFTGA, the World Federation of Tourist Guides Associations, will be having their, um, will be having a virtual conference as well. So we'll be having a virtual conference. I'm helping organize that with uh, other members of WFTGA. And that will be a way to get the international tourist guide community all together. Now, just a little word of warning and let me just look at this quickly. The, um, it's gonna be early morning because we're doing things Austria time. So there'll be some early sessions, uh, probably around 6 a.m. I think, um, New York time. So a lot of us, I've already warned um, the president of WFTGA that we'll probably be in our pajamas for most of the sessions, but it will be three days of some really fun sessions on the educational day, on the future of tourist guiding, a professional day with experts leading panel discussions and a variety of fields, and then a business day. And that's important because WFTGA has 
It's um, business that has to be taken care of with round tables and um, ending with some social activities and including a presentation from the hosts for the next in-person one, which is Serbia. And they'll be talking about visiting Novi Sad and, um, and giving us news on that. So that's in March, March 4th, 5th, and 6th. So we're working on that and you'll be able to um, register for that um, hopefully um, quite soon. Okay, so that's really it from me. I hope everybody is doing well. I've seen some nice posts about people getting vaccinated or getting their first rounds of vaccines or at least getting their appointment for their, for their vaccines. So I'm really excited and happy to see that's happening. And um, here's hoping we all get them very soon and we'll all be able to, um, we'll all be able to you know, meet each other in person. Oh, Debbie, I see you as a question. Will these events count towards certified guide maintenance? That you need to bring up with the certification committee. You can ask um, members of the committee what counts. I can't decide what, what counts or doesn't, but I think conference participation um, does count as well. And oh, Kevin said yes. And I saw somebody raise their hand. Um, we're not going to be calling on people. So if you raise your hand or if you raise it accidentally, just lower it. But please type your questions into the chat. General questions go into chat. The Q&A will be for our two speakers. And so, um, yeah, so last thing, just everybody stay well, stay healthy, stay socially distanced. I, I'm sure we're all um, still wearing our masks as usual, but um, hang in there. Okay. It's, we're in the deep dark winter right now, but the snow's pretty. Um, there are owls in Central Park uh, that you can go into town to see. And um, yeah, I, so, yeah, I see a lot of hands going up. So guys, please put your questions into the chat. We're not gonna be calling on you so we can keep the meeting, meeting going. So yeah, so we'll keep the meeting going. Uh, thank you all for listening. Remember, you can always keep in touch if you have questions or issues contact the board, board at gannick.org. And with that, I'm going to hand everything over to Billy, who will be introducing our two speakers. So take it away, Billy. Thanks, everybody. Hi, thank you very much, Emma. You're welcome. So I just wanted to mention that uh, today when I was looking at the Guides Association of New York City Facebook page, I saw someone had posted an article about the Village Cigar Shop down in Greenwich Village. And many questions were in the comments regarding, isn't this a landmark? Isn't this a historic district? What can they do with this building? And I realized that thanks in great part to our presenters tonight, I could actually answer most of those questions pretty well. So without further ado, uh, tonight's speakers are architectural historian Francis Moroni and the historic district's advocacy director, Kelly Carroll. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Francis, you need to unmute. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, Billy, the reason that Kelly and I were asked uh, to be here tonight is that uh, Billy uh, enrolled in a program that we have at NYU, which is a certificate program. You know, NYU is very, very big on these certificate programs. Uh, I don't know if everyone here is familiar with with how that works. Universities, of course, are known for degree programs. Uh, you get a BA in this, or you get an MA or an MS in that. But in addition to that, um, in recent years particularly, uh, certificate programs have grown extraordinarily in popularity. And they serve a variety of purposes. In some fields, uh, a certificate program from a school like NYU or Columbia actually counts as professional certification. Um, in other fields, however, it's just a form of continuing education. 
And uh, although these are university courses, you, you, there, are, there are tests, there are grades, there's the whole shebang. If you participate in one of these certificate programs, it's part of your permanent record. You know, like uh, Google is going to know. Uh, so uh, the uh, I, some years ago, uh, came up with an idea at NYU where I've been teaching for the last quarter century. I, it doesn't look like that's possible, but it's uh, true. The last quarter century, I came up with this idea for a certificate program around the subject of historic preservation. Why would this make sense? Because after all, Columbia has its world-renowned master's degree program in historic preservation. And Kelly, um, who will be speaking in a moment, is a product of that world-renowned program. And uh, Pratt Institute has a master's degree program in historic preservation, and many other schools do as well. In fact, it seems like there are more and more schools all the time that are developing these programs. Uh, I was just speaking earlier today with a student from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, which has a master's degree program in historic preservation, and so on and so forth. But what occurred to me was that I know a lot of architects, um, just sort of the world that I live in um, is heavy on practicing architects. And something that I had learned over the years is that most, the vast majority of practicing architects have little or no knowledge of either historic preservation or of a lot of the stuff that goes into historic preservation, such as a basic understanding of historic architecture. Because, you know, none of that is taught in architecture schools. None of it. So very often these architects would, at some point in their careers, uh, come up against historic preservation or historic architecture. Maybe they were working on an addition to a historic building, or maybe they became involved in the restoration of a historic building, and they were going into it blind. My thought was that these mid-career professionals, the term that we use, mid-career professionals, that's all of us, um, that they weren't in a position to drop everything and apply to the master's program at Columbia. Although that might be ideal for them, it's totally impractical. So how about a program that would condense all of that into a certificate program of four courses? And that's what I developed uh, at NYU. I recruited faculty, Kelly uh, being part of that faculty, and you'll hear from her. She, her, she has a, a, a tremendous background in the field. And we have also Carol Clark, whom some of you may know, who teaches in the Columbia program and who also has about as extensive a resume in the field as is humanly possible to have. And then there's, you know, me. Uh, so together, we came up with the four courses that we thought would give people the solid background in this subject that we thought would, uh, would sort of get them over the hump that they had encountered. So we went into this thinking, okay, this program is primarily going to be for mid-career professionals in architecture, maybe urban planning, maybe some real estate development people. Um, and we ended up being a little surprised. Although the program did draw 
such people, it also drew a much broader range of people than we expected. It drew a lot of people who were simply interested in the subject. It drew a lot of people who were approaching the subject from different angles, like law or community activism or tour guides. Uh, Billy, for instance, whom you all know, uh, enrolled in the program. And, you know, I would, you know, I don't know if Billy would like to say a couple of words about uh, his expectations for the program and what he got out or is getting out of the program. He hasn't finished it yet. Um, but um, but the, the fact is, is that we were very pleasantly surprised by the very broad range of interest in the program. And so I thought that uh, we would just give you a very, very brief taste of the program. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. Um, you know, before last March, I never uttered the phrase, I'm going to share my screen in my entire life. And I now say, I'm going to share my screen every single day. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and uh, just hang on one second here while I... Uh, there we go. Can you all see the slide that's up on the screen? All right. These are the titles of the four courses. It's possible that in future we'll add additional elective courses, but each of these four courses must be satisfactorily completed in order to get the certificate. And the certificate's like a, an actual thing. You can like frame it and put it on your wall, um, which, which is great. You know, my thought was, you know, an architect in his office would have his architecture degree and his certificate from NYU up on the wall and, uh, and so on. But the courses are Understanding Traditional Architecture. This is my course. This is basically what I do. This is basically what I have always done. Um, and that is to base, get people to understand what the elements of historic architecture are, the historic styles of architecture and approaches to architecture with a very heavy emphasis on classical uh, architecture. It is, I think, a pretty the comprehensive and rigorous course um, that I've put a lot of uh, uh, energy into, but happily so because there is absolutely nothing else in the world that I enjoy more than talking to people about this subject. Um, Preservation, Planning, and Practice is Carol Clark's course, and it is basically the course the introductory course that she teaches at Columbia. So you are not only get you're getting uh, the actual Columbia level of pedagogy here. Kelly, is this the correct title of your course? Yes, I I had it a longer one behind the scenes in New York, but um, I for the presentation I've I've just been saying preserving a city of neighborhoods. Yes. Okay. Kelly teaches this course, and there's absolutely no one on the planet who is better qualified to teach the course because Kelly is the director of outreach for the Historic Districts Council. Kelly will say more about this, but she's out every day pounding the pavements and meeting with community groups and so on. Basically, um, there are few, if any, other individuals in New York City today who are actually making the sort of gears of preservation move more than Kelly. And then there is changing standards in historic preservation. And this too is my course. So yeah, I do two of them. And I guess bottom line is if you don't like me, 
you better not enroll in this program. Um, but if you uh, feel that you can take two uh, courses uh, that I teach, then fine. The Changing Standards in Historic Preservation is a course that is about exactly what the title says. It's about how we have changed our views of what and how to preserve over time. It includes his history of historic preservation, but it also includes much about how we have done things differently in different years or different decades or different periods in New York City. Something that is designated as a landmark in 2021 may not even have been considered for designation in 2001 or 1971. Um, and this is the result of changing standards. Uh, and there's much else that goes into that course as well. Um, now, my course, Understanding Traditional Architecture, and I'm teaching it this semester, um, beginning on February 16th. It's actually still time to register um, uh, if, you, if you want to. And I teach it pretty much every semester. Uh, is uh, a course that actually takes you through um, the, well, through the history of Western architecture and how uh, the elements of Western architecture have developed and evolved and not least, and, and to help you to understand the historic and traditional buildings that you see in a city like New York. Um, not just in Mantua, but in New York, uh, so that you can look at a building and you can understand what the architect was trying to do with that building, understand uh, what the, that architect's sources were for that building, and not least be able to name the parts of that building, uh, to be able to say, um, uh, you know, he's... Uh, those are interpenetrating orders, or uh, to be able to label the different pieces of ornament in the building. Now, I'm going to just, everybody close your eyes for a second. I'm going to shoot ahead, um, and I want to uh, say that a big part of the course, because this is, again, this is my thing, is about architectural ornament. Very, very important thing. Most people, as you all know, look at a building and they think, oh, what a nice building, a beautiful building, beautiful ornament, but how often are you actually focusing in on that ornament, trying to understand what all of the patterns are, and not least, put a label to all the pieces of ornament. Once you're able to focus your eyes on the different bits, and once you're able to put a label onto things, it actually opens up worlds of perception, I think, for you and uh, for the people whom you're talking to about this uh, architecture. Uh, now, I uh, draw very heavily from the book that I co-wrote with the late Henry Hope Reed, who was my my friend and mentor, um, and who was more knowledgeable about ornament in the classical tradition than was probably anybody else in New York. Uh, and in that book that we did on the New York Public Library, The Architecture and Decoration of the Stephen A. Schwartzman Building, which was published in 2011, uh, we sought to identify and label every single piece of ornament in the New York Public Library and also to identify every single material used in the New York Public Library. And so that book, um, and by the way, the main reading room right behind me is a photograph from that book. Um, this is one of the major sources that I use in 
teaching this course. Uh, I think it's a really exciting course for people who are uh, truly interested in historic architecture. I would go so far as to say that it's really the only course of its kind that is as wide-ranging and as detailed of its kind that is available in New York City. And I should point out that it also draws a lot of people who are not enrolled in the certificate program, but just taking the course. And that's something that it is, it's possible to do as well. Um, and I think that uh, rather than my going on any more about this, I'll wait and see um, what questions you may have. And Kelly um, will say a little bit more. So Kelly, say a little bit more. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. Yeah. I'm also going to share. Oh, can you? There we go. Um, I just need you to stop sharing so I can begin. And um, Thank you for that lovely introduction about our certificate program. And thank you to Billy for setting this all up for us. Um, just give me one second. There we go. All right. So um, I'm Kelly Carroll. As Francis introduced me, um, I did go to the Columbia program. And when Francis approached me about this class, um, he asked me, one, if I would be interested, which I absolutely was, and two, could I, could I take everything that I do in my job and turn it into a class? And I sat down and put some pen to paper and I realized that I absolutely had a class. Um, so this class is really a hybrid of both the training and knowledge that I got from Columbia and how I applied that to my job in my real life. And then the other half being what I do for my job. So you'll have the benefit if you choose to enroll, which I hope you do, and seeing how I'll share with you the skills that I learned in school and how those apply to the real world and how um, our real world of New York City um, can benefit your job as tour guides. As um, Billy offered me wonderful feedback at the end of the course and said how much he learned and he actually used in his day-to-day -day life as a guide. Um, and our students are, are wonderfully diverse and um, some are just taking this out of interest. I think that Francis and I both have, are, these are just wonderful courses for general interest. So you should absolutely try one. Um, so a little bit about what I do for my, my day job. Um, right now I'm in Buffalo working remotely, but I, I work for the Historic Districts Council. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Community Outreach. I've been there since 2014, so it'll be seven years this coming May. Um, my job is basically, half of my job is I'm the primary liaison to every single community group, block association, community board in all five boroughs. So that means over my time, I've interacted with all 500, over 500 of our groups. So from the Beachside Bungalow Association in the Rockaways, all the way to, you know, people in Bedford Park in the Bronx um, and no in Norwood area, Moshaloo Parkway. So, um, and I keep trying to penetrate Staten Island and spread the good word of landmarking, but it's, it's proven quite difficult, but I've tried. Um, and the other half of the time I spend every week at the Landmarks Commission, which I can now testify from home, which is wonderful. Um, no one liked that room in one center street downtown. So I've, I've, write, I've written thousands of testimony over the past seven years. Um, so this class basically condenses those two areas and we, approach it from my citywide perspective. So this is very much um, a lot of the classes that I took about New York when I was at Columbia all focused on Manhattan. And this class really is going to take us out for a walk and visit some places you may have lost well, guys, I'd be surprised if you hadn't been, but we're going to go off the beaten path more. And I'm going to share with you firsthand experiences about some of my work with 
you know, communities you don't hear about as much. And I like to um, talk about two historic districts that I've had a direct hand in creating um, recently were uh, the East 25th Street Historic District. That's uh, our newest historic district in New York. It was designated uh, this fall. It was the first historic district in New York City ever designated remotely um, and obviously during a pandemic. It's also the first historic district in uh, that area of Brooklyn that uh, since 1965, actually the Wyckoff House, which was the first landmark ever designated by the Landmarks Commission in 1965, is the only other landmark in that community district. So it, it took until 2020 for them to come back. So we're gonna hear about these real life um, districts. Another one was in Bay Ridge, which is where I live that I worked on. So you, you all will really get a good walkabout town um, and hear a, from a community perspective and really learn what it means. You'll have the knowledge to know how a historic district or a landmark is created um, and all of the forces at play. Um, the other thing which Billy brought up and I'll get to is you'll learn exactly what landmarking means. Um, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Um, but this is also a fun course, especially for right now when we can't get out um, and go for walks. My, uh, my actually my first semester teaching is when we all had to go remote. And so I had to change the assignments um, to have students choose buildings instead of us going to walk around and see them in person. So this is also a neat little once a week exploration of New York. Um, so I'm gonna touch on some of the, some of the classes. It's, um, it's a 10 week course. So I'm gonna talk about, about half of the topics I'll cover in, in those 10 weeks um, because I wouldn't wanna give the whole, whole class away. But one thing that I like to talk about, which I start off the course with, is the is this cultural landmarks um cultural landmarks are are in my opinion are, are the future of historic preservation um our society our culture is, is changing continuously changing to be more inclusive which is a good thing and that's kind of challenging this old notion of well it has siding on it so it doesn't matter you know what prodigy grew up there or the significance, cultural significance attributed to it. If it's ugly, we're not gonna landmark it. And that's how it was um, for a very long time. And Francis um, touches on that in his class, but we're gonna look at cultural landmarks from, uh, from community perspectives, why buildings matter to people. It gets you to think about what buildings matter to you. And then you can impart that when you're you're giving your tours. You know, if, if people are always more interested in what people have to say if it's coming from a personal, if it's real. So this is how we open the course. And we're also gonna really look at how um, how we can we we call it make the case. Um, you probably all know what a statement of significance is when, whether it's a national register nomination or a, his, or a New York city landmark, there's always a statement that says why this building is a landmark or why it's important. Um, you can also make the case for alterations. Um, so we're gonna look at those. And also we're gonna look at buildings that could, while significant culturally or otherwise, could absolutely never be landmarked because our law only goes so far. And sometimes the landmarks law is not the right tool to protect properties. Um, and I'll leave you with on this side, Greenwood Cemetery should never be landmarked. And if you wanna find out why you're gonna to have to take my class and Billy, don't tell anyone. So another area that, uh, <laughs> that Billy opened with was, I hear this all the time, all of the time. Every time something's being, uh, altered or sold or a neighbor wants to, you know, put a swimming pool in their backyard of, in a, the Upper West Side, anything. I always hear, but I thought it was landmarked. But isn't it a landmark? They'll call me. But isn't it landmarked? They can't do that. It's a landmark. And I just say, oh, I wish I just had the time to really, you know, I want to say you should just come to the Landmarks Commission for an hour every Tuesday and, and have a look. 
So we're going to really do a deep dive into exactly what being landmarked means. Um, and that will also help your understanding and your education of people when they ask you what a landmark is on your tours, because landmarking is often perceived as it's frozen in amber or it's frozen in time. And preservationists, we have, and I'm self-identifying preservationists, we have this bad reputation that we hate change and that we just want everything to look exactly as it did in a nice year like 1885 and for the world to stop. And that's absolutely not true. So I think this is one of the more important classes um, because it also will show and demonstrate the limit of landmark designation. Uh, we have the strongest landmarks law in the country, but we're gonna look at cases of buildings um, where you wonder um, how could this have happened if it's a landmark? And we're really going to explore the magic word in the landmarks world, which is appropriateness. And this is um, this is 10J. This is actually, so this is a building that is in a New York City historic district. This is in Dumbo. And this was a warehouse building, uh, which is listed as, a, even though I don't like this word, in our municipal law, I don't like this word, contributing building or style building. This was a building that was allowed to have um, its entire, an entire facade that faces the river uh, ripped down and replaced with a glass curtain wall. Um, so, and that was appropriate under, um, under our city's process. So we're going to look at a lot of really neat case studies and talk about that because um, it is a bit interesting, right, that we have these eight over eight double hung woods and then we have this crystal shard happening. So another really fun thing about this course is this is the hands-on, the real stuff, real life stuff, or if, if you're not like me and trying to convince the Landmarks Commission to designate buildings, this is the fun stuff that you can do, um, stay up on your computer until midnight researching that strange building that you've always wondered about. So this course will provide um, tools. Oh, my computer, there we go, it was unplugged, excuse me. Um, this course will provide the tools to really, we're not going to, we're not going to touch, we're not going to touch anything. We're not getting into the archives. We're not getting into the dust. We're, um, we're just going to focus on every single thing you can research remotely, which, um, I didn't even mean for it to set it up this way. I'm just so busy at my job that I don't, I don't have the time to go in person to archives. So I share with everyone the tools that I use when I need to make a convincing case based on actual primary sources to put together narratives about buildings that people are asking me for help for. And so most recently, um, I have a, a staff of doctors in uh, Con the Coney Island Hospital out in Coney Island, Brooklyn. Um, and they asked me to put together uh, an RFE for them. An RFE is a request for evaluation. And these are some of the the snippets I've found I wanted to share. So all this and more, you'll you'll leave the course um, hopefully prepared to put together something similarly. And you'll have to choose your own building and present it to me and the class using the tools we learned about in class. So it's a really fun assignment. Another thing we'll look at is um, there's a lot of I feel like preservation is becoming more and more political and I isn't everything masks everything so we're going to really dissect the most common arguments and attacks that I hear or that I read about preservation and we're going to really get into the meat of these and have talks about it and I'm going to share what I know a, a, to be fact and really try to inform you all about these issues, which are, touch on really important things right now, such as, you know, elitism, such as, um, you know, do preservationists hate affordable housing? Are preservationists NIMBYs? We're gonna talk about all of these issues and look at case studies like the Strand who convinced half of New York City that if they became landmarked that that was gonna put them out of business. And that's really frightening 
to me because I like to think that bookstore people and preservationists were kind of on the same team. And I saw this splinter um, a few years ago. So we're gonna look at things like that and really have a talk about them. And, um, you know, our, I love, this is a slide from one of my classes. This is one of the, uh, a quote from one of these um, very well circulated attacks on preservation. And I just use this image in Bedford Stuyvesant because um, unlike the quote, I would argue that, that um, this, this block is very interesting and very beautiful. And it, it is in fact in a district. Uh, and then part of a class is, that will give a more personal perspective is I always have guest speakers every semester directly from the communities that I work with. And so hearing firsthand from them about why they want preservation also um, kind of ties in, very much ties into the, the last topic that I just did, addressed like these, is preservation elitist and so on and so forth. And we just wanna stop, we just wanna, rich people just wanna preserve their views and blah, blah, blah. Um, this is the uh, East 25th Street Block Association with newly elected council member, Farrah Lewis, who is in the pink blouse, second from the left. Um, and they are, they are just the one most wonderful block. They've won the greenest block in Brooklyn four times from the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And then they decided to crank it up a notch in their stewardship and go for landmarking. And that is the first block um, ever remotely designated, as I mentioned. And um, last semester, Billy and everyone got to hear directly from the blocks, President Julia Charles, who's in the red top. Um, and I just think hearing firsthand from people who are not capital P preservationists like me, but lowercase p preservationists, meaning like community people is invaluable uh, because, you know, I always love hearing why real people value preservation and why they seek it out. Um, and as opposed to it being this, this top down thing that the government does to you. Um, my experience is that it's the opposite, so. Um, and then we'll also look at some failed preservation campaigns and some of them are actually um, tragically hilarious. Um, and then this is going to be much less technical than Francis class. Um, I do not even pretend to have the technical language that Francis has, but depending on how, depending on which order you take these classes, if you happen to take mine first, it's a really good primer to just be able to describe a building, to look at any building and, and be able to write and talk about it in a way that makes sense to me and to other people. Uh, and we'll look at, you know, historic prototypes. Uh, we do a whole session on storefronts, uh, which is why I've included this little guy. He's one of my favorites in, on Emmons Avenue in Sheepshead Bay, down by where I live. Um, and this is what I was saying. So I'm actually gonna skip this because it's probably embarrassing compared to Francis's, but, uh, and uh, we're also gonna look at reading buildings in general. Like I, I remember when I was a student and I had a building that I was assigned to research in Chelsea and Andrew Dolcart looked at it for one second. He goes, oh, it's, it's missing its cornice. It's missing its, its windows were replaced and it looks like it's, its ornament was stripped. And I was like, how does he know that? He never even saw this building before. I didn't have those eyes yet because I didn't know anything. I was learning, but I have those eyes now. And so I actually provide training to community boards to look at buildings and to look at C of A's in a certain way. And so I'm gonna share that with you all so that you can look at a building also and kind of these things will just jump out at you. So, um, and we're gonna look at all buildings. We're not just gonna look at, you know, the Chrysler buildings of the world. We're gonna look at real stuff that you see every day and maybe you'll look at differently after you take the class. So that is what I've got. I, that's just a little taste. Um, this is my email and um, I'm gonna stop so that we have time for questions. Thank you. Cool. If I may just very quickly add one thing. Um, thanks, Kelly, um, very much. Um, you also, in this program, get to go to the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, to a hearing. So, you know, you're sort of exposed to the whole 
the whole shebang. If you've never been there, I remember our very first class that visited an LPC hearing was one where the police actually had to come and arrest someone, <laughs> one of the speakers. And, you know, it's like all the students were, who knew that this was so exciting? Uh, but I remember that one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, you, you do get a very strong exposure to the field. And... Uh, Questions. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Uh, Kelly, if you could turn off your screen share so everyone could. Oh, see. sure. Yeah. So, and and this is just something to our um, to our attendees. If you keep it on gallery view, you can see everybody. If you have speaker view, you'll just see the person um, speaking at that at that moment. So, thank you guys. This was so informative, and it was really great to hear what the program was about. And, and Francis, I have to say everybody oohed and awed at that slide with all the little labels. And, <laughs> and I, when I do, a, I do, a, a, um, a, I do tours and I talk about um, Beaux-Arts architecture and I'll say, you know, the, all the twiddly bits, you know, that's all the twiddly bits. And so I'll sort of use that as my general term when I don't want to get into egg and dart or dentals and all of that. So um, this was really great. Billy, why don't you um, start off on our Q&A? Um, sure. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I saw pop up in uh, from Debbie Mason was uh, she just kind of wanted me to mention what I'm getting out of taking these classes. Uh, making those charts for architectural features on buildings has been a big part of it. Uh, learning to argue both for and against landmarking a building. Uh, arguing for wonderful buildings like Emma's favorite, 60 Wall Street. I hate that building, sorry. <laughs> I, I, mean, I did a great presentation on that building. I was so proud of that. And yeah, anyway, but um, other things. And there's been, a, I've, I've noticed a few questions coming into chat as well. And people asking about specific cases and we'll get to those. Maybe we'll get to one of those if we have time. But what I want to mention is as far as this class goes, the idea is when you take this class, you won't just be asking Francis and Kelly about these cases. You will be able to make these cases. You will be able to make arguments for and against uh, certain things you're going to see in the city. It's uh, that that's kind of the point. You're you're not just saying like, "Hey, Francis, what do you think about the new tower they're putting up on Fifth Avenue?" Instead, he will probably say, "Well, what do you think about it? You have ten minutes to tell me about it and uh, convince me of what you think about it." That's kind of the idea of these classes. So, a couple of these questions I want to uh, to address. Uh, one that came up a lot and. I know that uh, we we that Emma has posted the link in chat, but the one that I know that everyone's thinking about right now is how much does this cost? So I'll kind of let uh, let Francis address that. And <laughs> yeah, uh, Kelly, how much does it cost? I believe it's about seven hundred dollars a pop a class. If if you sign up for the whole certificate program, then it's uh, a little bit cheaper. So I think I ended up doing all four of the classes for as long as you declare a certificate canacy, I like all four, the whole shebang was around 2,400. And that's with saying, hey, I, I'm in the certificate program. So as long as you commit to doing all four of them, then it, it costs a little less. A little, little cheaper than Columbia, a little. Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, a, and a more sort of, and I'm sorry, Billy, if, I, if I'm stepping in, um, um, but one thing that I think is on a lot of people's mind, like when you said, Kelly, you know, when people say, well, isn't this landmarked? And to go to what Billy said at the beginning, people are like, isn't this a landmark building? Is there something that 
guides can can sort of keep in mind when they're asking that very question. I mean, of course, you know, yes, it'd be great if we could all take the class and, and but not all of us actually can, but that that sort of that sort of way of thinking, like you said, like thinking like a preservation is with a big P as opposed to a small P. And so, um, so what's something to keep in mind? So when you're thinking about whether something should be landmarked or not, just as sort of in, in terms of general, um, a general idea. I would always keep in mind, I feel like for some reason people, and maybe it's because of the, the National Preservation Act and the National Register of Historic Places. And we have the Secretary of Interior Standards, which are so purist. And so, you know, if it's there, you gotta leave it there. If it, you know, repair, restore. Um, I think the biggest takeaway is that New York City's landmarks law is in no way comparable to the you know to the national register in any in any way our our law is our our own thing in new york it's okay to you build a tower on top of a landmark you know the hearst building for exa example um there's countless there's countless or the domino sugar factory on williamsburg's waterfront right now which is basically under our landmarks law allowed to be turned into a ruin and then have a skyscraper inserted into it so I think the short answer is to just say that our law is our own thing and anything is possible. So did that go to the question actually that Kevin Wilkinson asked that we said, so are real estate developers villainized or, I mean, is their reputation justifiably villainized or should their reputation be, you know, lauded for, for doing those kinds of things? I mean, like, like you said, mentioned Domino, you know, they end up, they end up preserving, shall we say the factory mm -hmm. to, by building that tower, you know, so are they destroying things to preserve them? Or, I mean, I, I, you see what I mean? It's so sort of this question of, do, should we be NIMBYs, YIMBYs, or how should how do we deal with that when it comes mm -hmm. to preservation? You you deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis, which is yeah. exactly how the commission does. Um, that's why it's, um, depending on the project, you could be an evil developer or you could be saving the building. It really yeah. is on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, and I think that's what's so neat about our city's law is that nothing is apl applied with a broad brush. Right. And also it goes to the theme of the, the course that I do called Changing Standards. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just a very interesting thing to see how over time our approaches to these things change. The idea behind the landmarks law isn't to preserve everything in a specific state. It's to have a measure of control over the way things change. So, for instance, a project like Domino, um, you know, probably would have been approached very differently 30 or 40 years ago. Um, you know, I, I have often said, you know, when I'm sort of like in a bad mood that, you know, today they probably would approve the Marcel Breuer Tower on top of Grand Central Terminal, uh, which, you know, is the case that led to the, the Supreme Court ruling on the constitutionality of landmarks laws. Um, so these things really do change a lot over time. And it's, uh, it's a very slippery field very slippery but that's also part of what makes it so much fun yeah i think that i mean that's something really good to keep in mind like you said it's a case by case basis i mean we were and i'm on the um the government relations committee and we were talking and where we do interact with um the lpc and um we're very happy to hear you know that duffield street in brooklyn was um is now you know landmark and that's like a you know it's kind of rinky dinky little ugly building, but it's important mm -hmm. historically. And so that's something that that justifies, like you said, through the case by case. And we're sort of getting tight with the time. Um, one thing, actually, if you could think about this, um, and perhaps we can email you, do you have a sort of uh, a go to resources? For guides, you know, you can you can fall into these into these rabbit holes. And I've done that many times. And you're looking at historic photos and things like that. What would you say 
are your go-to um, resources that you that you really like, and perhaps even in terms of books. I mean, I used to buy me, I still have all my books. You know, it's nice to have a book book every so often. And if there's something that you can think of that, you know, you say every guide who's interested in architecture, make sure they have this besides your books, Francis. But um, <laughs> you know, these kinds of go-to things that that you that you like that you like people to have. So um, if you, I don't know if you want to type some of those in or maybe give us a list. Um, in the meantime, Billy, maybe you wanted to ask the question about 40 seconds. Well, I think Francis's books are fantastic, by the way. And I used one of them when I was studying for my tour guides license test. So that, and that should tell you something right there. I mean, that means it's definitely worthwhile. So I'll speak on behalf of Francis's books. Um, yeah, there's 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 one more question there while uh, while I let you guys like consider that. And but I will tell you this, like I got a great reading list by taking the class. Mm -hmm. That's a really good way to do it. There is a there are entire chapters of this class and sessions dedicated to building research. So I mean, you guys just can't give the whole class away. I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, I would, I know, but nuggets, I, little tidbits, you know. I would say my go to, my two go tos, Google Street View and 1940s tax photos. Oh, the ones with the little, with the little numbers. Yeah, I use both of those every single day. Yeah, and and speaking of online resources, um, you know, I I came up, and I'm going to guess that a lot of you did as well in an era before there was this thing called the internet. <laughs> um, and the, the way that, uh, you know, materials have been digitized. Now, uh, Kelly made some good points about doing remote research and, and, and so on. Um, the truth of the matter, though, is that if you want to do a really comprehensive report on a building, you can't do it entirely remotely because the historic DOB, Department of Buildings Records, in the five boroughs aren't digitized, uh, which is, you know, seems amazing until you realize, ah, it's New York City government right? Um, you know, it's a wonder that they've digitized anything. Um, and these records aren't digitized. The, you know, deeds and conveyances in the Brooklyn Historical Society, uh, an essential building research resource, not digitized. But newspaper archives, everybody knows this because you all, you know, uh, search in the New York Times all the time. You know, unless you are familiar with the before and after, before newspaper digitization and after, you have no idea how amazing that is. But on that score, real estate record and builder's guide is just, oh, you know, uh, you know, I'll just look up something in real estate record and builder's guide and emerge eight hours later. <laughs> not realizing where all the time has gone because it is just so fantastic yeah, and, and so that's been digitized by columbia okay so and that would be on so that would be on the columbia um website? yes okay. yes real estate record and builder's guide you know it's very finicky to search um you have to uh but it's uh you know, it, this was an amazing publication that covered the real estate world and the world of building in New York for 75 years and, uh, and just in extraordinary depth and detail. And the articles are great. I mean, you learn things there that you learn nowhere else. And it's full text searchable. Finicky. But can be done. Yeah, I mean, and one thing also just to, to, to guides in, in general to keep in mind, so many museums and collections have their digital archives that are accessible online. But like you said, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, get into it and you have to be able to see 
see things yourself, you know, be able to go to these research institutions, which is not you know, always possible um, mm -hmm. these days. I mean, I know I've fallen down these rabbit holes on the theme of the city of New York photo collections, mm. um, all these different things. And even just a very simple thing, um, you know, and here's the art history professor coming out, um, you know, even with when you're following the footnotes, just follow the footnotes and follow those links. And once you get into some end notes and then you keep going into those, um, then, you know, then you'll find yourself, you know, somewhere you didn't realize you were going. And so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. So um, that's great. Thank you guys very much. Um, let's, you know what, Bill, we should ask um, Bill's question about the proposal for um, the tower to replace the Grand Hyatt right next to Grand Central Terminal. You know, pretend you're on, you're a pundit on, on, you know, TV being asked your 30 second take on that. So Francis, mm. you want to go first? You know, I, uh, I, 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 I kind of developed a weird fondness for the Grand Hyatt Hotel <laughs> over the years. I hate to admit it, but it's, uh, it, it, you know, it, things become familiar <laughs> and, and it's, and you don't want them to go, but I guess, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I guess it, I guess it will. I mean, given my druthers, they'd rebuild the Commodore, but I know that, that that's, that that's not going to happen. I I just uh, I don't have a the the pictures that I've seen of the replacement look kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know if Kelly has any uh, opinion of it. <laughs> Is this one Vanderbilt? No, no, it's the one that's going to replace the Grand Hyatt. On the I haven't. I actually have not seen. It's it's an S O M building. Big surprise there. Sorry. That and <laughs> and I and I I I. Oh, never mind. I was going to say something really snarky, and I I shouldn't. We like snark. We like snark. <laughs> Please do. No, I I have that has not um that is I have not seen renderings for, for that. I saw the most recent, uh, the, the concept for lower Manhattan based on a human cell. Um, <laughs> uh, I've not seen, I, I'm lucky. I think people filter what they send to me because I have so many imperiled landmarks that are lowercase landmarks that are threatened all the time that I think people spare me. Right. I think what's what's traumatizing guides right now is the idea that you know that wonderful photo that you can get when you're standing um, uh, at the I guess it would be the you're standing at the southwest corner across the street from Grand Central and you look diagonally up and you you can see that uh, that glorious um, you know sculptural grouping and you have Mercury and is outlined and then you get the Chrysler Building right there as well. And it's just that wonderful photo. You get some street signage in it. And it's just that mm -hmm. holding together over the viaduct. And if they put that yeah. honking great thing there by SOM, it's just going to be like, guess what? Glass and steel. Oh, joy. And so you won't be able to see Chrysler. You won't get that that juxtaposition of the two. I, I know it's 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 hard, very hard to think of Grand Central being sandwiched by 2,000 foot buildings. Um, you know, you figure... Gosh, they might as well have built the Marcel Breuer Tower. Yeah. yeah, at this point, we're sort of going there that way. Okay, well, um, Billy, anything else you'd like to add? I'm sorry, I always end up hijacking the conversation. No, I just want to. Uh, I just want to mention that I think for tour guides, having a safe space to argue about these kind of things <laughs> is totally worth the price of the class. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, just I, saying, just putting that out there. Well, I think yeah, we need to organize um, snarky Zoom meetings to 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 dis on uh, <laughs> proposals and non-proposals and yeah. So and since we'll be you know behind screens, we'll be relatively safe. We won't have to call you know NYPD to drag people out of meetings and the discussion oh. gets heated. Ah. Oh, and and just one last thing, if I may, mm -hmm. um, because a couple of people have asked this in the chat. Um, the four courses 
um, you know, they're, they're, they're offered in regular sequence all the time. Uh, I do my understanding traditional architecture almost every semester uh, because it, you know, it has a broader interest than, than just people in the certificate program. But all of them are done on a regular cycle. Um, you just have to complete the four. It's, uh, you can do two courses in a semester if you want. You can do one course each semester. You can do a couple of courses and then skip a semester. And then it's very easy that way. It's very flexible in terms of scheduling. Good to know, good to know. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you guys. We have gone over time, but uh, it was really factual and really, really interesting. And I'm, I'm sure you will see some more guides popping up at your, your classes and um, you will be definitely getting some emails from, from us asking questions. I put my email address in the chat. Perfect, thank you so much, thank you so much. Um, that's great, everybody. And um, yes, do you have any questions for the guides before we move on to our next section or, or any last tips of you know, words of advice, shall we say? Um. Not so. Thank you for having us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I hope, and I hope to hear from you all soon. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Well, thanks again. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to move on. And so Kelly and Francis, you can leave or I'll put you as attendees as, as, you, as you wish. And um, we'll move on now. Thank you so much, Billy. That was really, thank you for, for bringing them to speak with us. And thank you um, for, for um, helping introduce and move the conversation on. So we'll start with our committee reports. And so what I need to do, I'm sorry, let me just get my... Um, Push in gear. All right, let me see. I'm going to bring Matt Baker in, who will be giving us a, an update on the award ceremony. Okay, so Matt, I'm just bringing you on. Yeah, so thank you again, everyone, for speaking. So hold on. There we go. All right, so here's Matt. So Matt, as soon as you're ready, take it away. All righty. Can I be seen and heard okay? Yep, you're all set. Fabulous. Well, I want to say thank you. If Francis and Kelly are still here, uh, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, colleagues, if you liked Kelly, if you liked the sound of her voice, buy a ticket to the Gannick Apple Awards. She is going to be one of our presenters. She and her colleague from the Historic Districts Council, uh, Michelle Arbolu, will be uh, presenting Outstanding Achievement in Support of New York City Preservation. So uh, you get more Kelly Carroll uh, on the 22nd of February. I am putting in the chat the Eventbrite link. There it is for tickets. I know that a lot has been made this year of the fact that with the pandemic, we are all out of work. You know, money is tight. And the awards committee has heard that call and answered it. Uh, we reduced our production budget, not by half, but by two thirds, and we reduced our ticket price by 80%. You know, the live show that we normally do is a $25 ticket to see the show. The webcast is $5. That is an 80% reduction. So if you have ever thought, eh, do I want to see the Gannack Apple Awards? I'm not sure. Now's the time. Now is absolutely the chance to do it because you're paying so very little and because you can sit at home and watch it online. Uh, Kelly is not the only exciting presenter we have. Uh, I think partly because we are pre-recording all the presentations uh, and I have started that process. I, I spoke with uh, Jeff Spurgeon today and he was magnificent. Some of you know him uh, from WQXR and he was an absolute trooper. Uh, he put up with my clumsiness and, and, and did it beautifully in only two takes. Um, he is one example of the, um, um, oh, did I do that for panelists only? I apologize, I did. I don't know how that happened. Let me try that again. All panelists and attendees. Okay, one more time. Sorry about that. Thank you, Kevin. Sorry about 
about that. That was my my clumsiness there. Again, I've been clumsy all day. I apologize. Uh, because we're pre-recording the presentations and the presenters don't actually have to be available on the night of the show, uh, we have the single most exciting lineup of you know New York City celebrities that we have ever had so far. Uh, the award for outstanding essay article and series writing is presented by a lady who was synonymous with local news in New York City for an entire generation, Miss Roba Torre. Uh, the award for outstanding food is being presented by a gentleman who looms large in the neighborhood of Harlem, Mr. Marcus Samuelson. Uh, outstanding achievement in culture is uh, being presented by a gentleman whom some of you have seen on Broadway in Frozen as the Duke of Weselton, or off-Broadway in the title role of the musical Cagney, Mr. Robert Creighton. Um, the Outstanding Radio and Podcast Award, the aforementioned Jeff Spurgeon of WQXR, and several others. I've been back and forth with a couple of uh, terrific writers. Our nonfiction award, uh, Jim Mackin, uh, just uh, came out with a magnificent book about the people of the Upper West Side. Our fiction award, Hilary Bettis, is a writer for the TV series The Americans and won a WGA uh, award for the final season of The Americans, etc. Now, this said, we are still, remember, part of the major point, the reason the Gannett Apple Awards exist at all, is to bring tour guides and our industry and our association on the same stage as these luminaries. So the uh, Award for Outstanding Achievement in Support of New York City Tourism, as always, is being presented by two Gannett tour guides, Mr. Bill Harris and Ms. Sheila Evans. Uh, I chose both of them because they have a lot of international connections and you know, also connections in Washington, D.C. You know, Bill is a Gannick member, but also works a lot in Washington, so I'm hoping that they will draw a crowd from some of their uh, non-New York uh, clientele and affiliates. So that is what's happening, and it's going to be a very exciting show. Again, 8 p.m., February 22nd, the day after International Tourist Guide Day. The only recording of a presentation that I have not yet gotten a commitment for is the president of Gannick, Emma Guest Consalis, who, as usual, is being invited to open the show. Uh, and uh, I've sent her an email saying, so when do we want to record? And I haven't heard back from her yet. So we're going to get that taken care of shortly, I trust. Uh, but that's yeah. really all I have. You know, we, we have answered the call to, to, you know, be sensitive to the situation. And we've done that. And I am sincerely hoping that everyone, you know, will now answer our call and, you know, buy a very inexpensive ticket and tune into the gala on Monday the 22nd. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you very much. I think it'll be um, a really fun evening. And yes, yeah, so when I get that email, I'll be happy to get ready and record whatever you have me um, record. Oh, and one thing, Matt, do you know um, how many people have purchased tickets so far? Are we expecting a big crowd? I hope. So this time of the month, ticket sales are always very low. The, you know, between two weeks and three weeks before the event, you always have something between 50 and 100 tickets sold. The big, um, what's the word I want? The big spike in ticket sales always takes place during the last week uh, to a week and a half. And I'm sure that this year will be no exception to that as it's playing out the way it always does. Great. And then once, once you purchase your ticket, you will have the link to log in for the live stream as it occurs on that evening. Correct. Yes. Uh, once they, I've mentioned this in meetings past, but just as a refresher, uh, we're doing it on the platform live storm. Uh, you know, we tend to find it both less glitchy and more uh, conducive to big splashy presentations than Zoom, which is more meeting oriented. So yeah, the, the Eventbrite uh, will send you an email with the live storm registration link. Okay, great, right. great. Thank you very much, Matt, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to get, um, oops, I'm going to get Michael Dillinger on right now as our next presenter to speak about the certification program. So thank you very much. Okay, so Michael should be here in just a moment. There we are. Hey, Michael. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. It's always the 
iffy thing with all this high technology that we play with. Well, hi, everybody. Um, and uh, that was a great program, by the way, tonight. And uh, I just want to say for those of you who are already certified and thinking ahead for your certification maintenance, maintenance those programs do count. You can use those as certification maintenance points, okay? Um, all of those programs that they were talking about. Anyway, um, I wanna bring you up to date a little bit on what the committee has been doing. We have been meeting weekly to get the program finished. Uh, early on in COVID, we decided that we would try to move things online. And as we started working on that, we realized that there was an advantage to actually having an online program even without COVID because it makes accessibility easier for people that don't have to travel all the way downtown every week or a couple times a week. They can get the class online and uh, so we our aim is to really finish this up and we really worked very hard to, to to really get a very professional online learning program for you and um, the program it incorporates online study also live zoom sessions and there's a minimum of three in-person practicums during the course of the program and we're hoping to complete the major work on this by next monday now, originally, the plan was that once we had that done, we would probably launch the program sometime in late February, uh, early March. However, the committee has decided because of all of the uncertainty that is still with us today, all these months later, with COVID and with um, the idea of any kind of um, aid or support, you know, uh, any COVID relief, programs that are still that they're still talking about in Washington because of the insecurity that so many people feel at this time, we are not going to launch the program until it is appropriate when people do feel more secure in their lives financially and professionally. And so it's gonna be on hold. However, in the meantime, what we will do is we will set up a couple of, pro, of kind of like preview programs where you can look at a, a bit of the, the program. We've, uh, we can walk you through little pieces of it to kind of show you what's going on and what to look forward to when we finally do launch it. So uh, look for um, details on that that'll be coming up. The other thing I did want to mention is certification maintenance program. A main part of this certification program was that once you are certified, you still need to continue to develop professionally. It's not done and over. You've got to continue to develop. And part of the program is that you commit to continuing your professional education and development after you're certified and that way you maintain your organic certification. And so we finally got this piece of the program launched. And so those who were in 2017, 2018, and 2019, you all got emails earlier, early in 2020 about certification maintenance. We've sent out a, a survey. It's fairly easy to fill out. If there's any questions, you can email us at certification at GANIC.com if you have any questions, but it's pretty easy. And um, I think... Uh, we're hoping that you'll all take advantage of it. It's, it's, it's fairly easy to accumulate the points. It's a minimum of 10 points that you have to um, accumulate over the course of a year. Anyone who took the uh, 2020 certification, they don't have to maintain for 2020, but they have to start in 2021. And so uh, keep, a tr keep track of all of the things you're doing. And uh, we'll send out another re reminder email for those of you who are new to this about what the criteria are in terms of um, the different points and what we're looking for. But um, it's, it's pretty exciting that we finally got this piece of it done. Uh, it's a big weight off our shoulders as a committee. We worked really, really hard. I want to thank everybody on the committee for their commitment to showing up week after week for this and taking the time out to, to work on this and really bring their, 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 their perspectives and their talents and, um, and their time and their energy to get this done for Ghana. Because I think this is a really, really important part of being a Ghana member and the Ghana brand uh, going forward. So, um, that's about all I have, unless anybody's got any major questions at this point, but we're not going to have any announcement on a launch of the full program until such time as, you know, things are looking better for everybody financially and professionally. Just a, just a little um, question. Is there a reason why you only did a few certain classes rather than all of everyone who's been certified? Because if you, if you certified in 2020, you've already done the work for that year. Okay, so it's... So, so once your certification is good for the calendar year, so after the calendar year, then 
you you have to start maintaining so that's that's why the, the people in 2020 did not have to do this particular one and we really wanted to get it off the ground and uh you right. know I apologize to the 2020 people who may be confused about this, but we were really working to try and get so many things done. And uh, I think somebody said in in, um, in the chat, you know, one thing at a time, you know, yeah. uh, we just had to tackle one thing at a time. So yeah, and that, I mean, OK, now I see what you mean. That makes sense because you're, you've done it. And so it was done recently. So you're still valid for that year. And the people who've done it before need to, to show that they've they've kept up with stuff and I honestly have to say the form is I mean I just want to say compliments to the certification group it's really easy to follow and it's easy just to remember you know well I went to this conference or I went to that conference and just you know even if you just look and say oh, I did this fan tour that fan tour it's um I think it's that's great so thank you very much yeah question I, I just yeah James Ryan had a question if they answered the questionnaire will they hear back you will only hear back if the committee has a question there's something on the on what you've put out that we need a little more information or whatever. But otherwise, if you don't hear from us, that means that you have passed, you've fulfilled your obligation and more for that year. And remember, there's no point carryover. So whatever you do one year, you know, you, you can't like carry that over year to year. But, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's good to keep moving and to keep growing. So. Uh, <laughs> Great. All right. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you. And yeah, and then people, if you have specific questions, I'm um, just email um, certification at gannic.org and they will be able to help you out. Okay. So thank you, Michael. I'm going to bring Nina and in. Cedar is definitely certifiable. Yes. <laughs> yes. Andy <laughs> is certifiable. Yes. <laughs> we, I think, Andy, that's a go. Everybody was just like, yeah, we know that. So that's why we love you. Okay. All right. So I'm bringing Nina on. Thank you very much, Michael. You're all. Set. Okay, so let's see if Nina. Okay, Nina, if you unmute and yourself and put yourself on camera, that would be great. Here I am. Oh, my keeps. Okay, that should hold. Hi. Here you are. <laughs> yeah, here I am. Well, uh, hi. Uh, this is the Education Committee and the Core Report, and uh, we have an Executive Core, and uh, you probably know Bob Gelber, Kevin Lawrence, Jeremy Wilcox, uh, John Semlak, Susan Birnbaum. Lisa Puccio, Minna Sharp, and, and we thank Maggie Brown and Kit Garrett and uh, Andrea Coyle and Emeritus for their suggestions. Uh, we, uh, we have a lot of past, uh, what's wonderful about virtual tours is that you get to uh, get to see them again. And if you miss some, I'll just um, mention uh, three things that happen uh, one of them, January 14th, I don't know if everyone, uh, uh, not everyone got a chance to see from Federal Hall to Capitol Steps, inaugurations then and now. Uh, it was an education webinar. Uh, and we, I just received a link from Chris Bauer uh, from the DC Guild. This was um, a joint uh, webinar organized by the DC Guild Gannick and APT. Uh, in conjunction with the DC Gill's uh, annual meeting. And uh, it, it was wonderful. And now I have the link. And so if you missed it, you'll get a chance. Uh, all the GANIC members uh, can log in and see it. We'll, we'll post that to, uh, it's a Google link and we'll post it in the appropriate place, usually in documents. Uh, also, if you missed uh, Costa Rica and Echo Tourist Paradise, a virtual tour with Fred Flanser and, and uh, Costa Rican guide, Jose Diaz, that's uh, accessible on our document session. And January 29th, virtual uh, FAM, Queens Neighborhood History Tour, part two with Linda Fisher. That was on January 29th. So these tours are accessible. And what is very interesting, Linda contacted us and said, you know what, I, I have to give this tour. I think it was for the Municipal Art Society. Can I, can I pr practice on, uh, share it with Gannick before I actually give it? And we said, fine. And you just, uh, all you have, you know, she filled out the link and she was able to get it out of her mouth. It was wonderful. And a lot of guides do that, do this. Joe Savlak, oh, every time he would do a walking tour, we were the, be the beneficiary of his doing it for Gannick either before he did the tour or after he did the tour. But this is, uh, this is a resource available this time of year. Uh, you may be, uh, I know a lot of our guides are doing wonderful things for different uh, venues. 
uh, Venture Club, Untapped Cities, Bowery Boys, you name it, um, uh, all different places. And if you want to practice, you can practice on your fellow uh, organic members. So if you want to share your knowledge, you just get it out of your mouth. Don't. Uh, we're we're very um, we're very appreciative, and uh, so that is available to you to you know practice your tours and do get your tours out of your mouth. Now, uh, coming up in March, we're skipping all the way to March, uh, is uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire Memorial Fam Tour. And I was very happy to know that Robin Gar and Kevin Fitzpatrick are continuing organic uh, tradition started by the late Lee Gelber. Now, I, I, it probably will be in person. I don't know if Robin and Kevin will be pairing, pairing together or doing it separately doing two separate tours, but that's a tradition. We have a resume writing transferable, transferable skills PDP workshop in the works. And also thank uh, Richard Sanford uh, and the Red Cross for doing a PDP on disaster and emergency preparedness for tour guides, which unfortunately we don't, uh, it's not accessible because that was done with the Red Cross, but you can go on their website and get a lot of this information. So also you, you heard Billy introduce and, and, and uh, wonderful panelists for the guest speaker. Uh, thank Bob for helping out with that too. Uh, if you have any uh, suggestions for guest speakers, contact us and uh, you get to introduce them. And if you feel comfortable uh, uh, and if you, you can be a panelist or you can just, we get to introduce the guest speaker. So thank you for thinking of uh, us in that way. And uh, a PS, you know, uh, it's wonderful. A lot of our uh, Gatnet guides are out there doing virtual tours. And I just wanna say a, a special thank you to Art and Susan Zuckerman uh, for sharing their knowledge for free. I know a lot of these virtual tours that guys are doing, uh, you can find out about them on organic pages, but the Zuckermans are actually doing this free for organic members. So if you're an organic member, uh, you just, uh, they do them on Monday and Thursdays at 10 a.m. And every, every organic member is invited. There, no one is left out of this tour. Uh, so it's marscott at att.net. So and stay tuned for a lot of uh, some February uh, FAMs and PDPs to be announced. That's Great. It. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. And um, it's good to mention that. And also the behind the scenes um, hard work that goes on with the education committee and organizing stuff. And actually, I didn't, I forgot to mention when I mentioned our wonderful um, International Tourist Guide Day that we had last year, that was, you know, Bob Gelber did all this heavy lifting and helped organize a wonderful, wonderful day. So it's so many people behind the scenes and that's really what makes um, Gannett great. And so, you know, definitely a big shout out to Bob, you know, getting back to ITDG, you know, you're, you're sort of our model for what we would what we would like to do and how we would like those things to be organized. So, all right, thank you, Nina. Let's move on. Um, Mike is right here on the screen already. So Mike, do you wanna give us an update on industry relations? Thank you very much. Yep, absolutely. Thank you, everybody. I hope everybody's doing okay out there. Um, our committee is really uh, gaining momentum. We now have monthly uh, meetings scheduled. Our last one was January 28th. Our next one is February 25th. Generally, they're going to be Third, the last Thursday of each month uh, from um, 11 to 1, unless otherwise uh, noted. So if anybody would like to join our committee, uh, you can email me at industryrelations at gannick.org. Uh, we do have a couple of big announcements tonight. Um, so the first one is we're working on a big virtual event for the first week of May that we're tentatively calling Gannick Guide Week. And we're doing this in partner ship with uh, one of our industry partners who's already been referenced uh, tonight, Mitch Bach and Trip School. Um, and it's gonna incorporate educational sessions, virtual tour experiences and networking and interviewing opportunities kind of you know, replacing the job fair that we had to cancel uh, this past September due to COVID. Uh, we're just in the early planning stages of this uh, uh, program, which is uh, looking like it's gonna be a three day program. Uh, and we hope to have a lot more information for you guys at the March membership meeting. Um, a lot of you have attended various industry uh, events like IATDG or Arrival. Those are all great, but they kind of tangentially touch the tour guide experience. What we're trying to do is really create 
uh, a, a meaningful event that will set everybody up for success as a tour guide uh, for uh, the, the coming of the revenge tourism and when everything comes roaring back as everybody seems to be uh, projecting. IATDG is more for tour directors, Arrival is more for tour operators as an example. So the way we're envisioning it right now, and this is all subject to change, but the first two days are gonna be uh, educational days, learning days, uh, filled with online sessions, uh, specifically crafted to help tour guides transition to the post COVID tourism world. Topics may include entrepreneurship, web design and strategies, taking advantage of OTAs and uh, other platforms like Airbnb experiences, uh, technology topics, storytelling techniques, uh, business and back office operations like incorporating invoices, things like that, setting long, uh, sorry, short and long-term business goals, using mar market research to your advantage to uh, market your tours to specific markets and also finding markets for your tours. Um, so we're just starting to get going on this. We'd love to hear what topics you would like us to address um, at this uh, event. And also if you have any suggested presenters, and we, we certainly have a uh, stable that we're going to approach, but that doesn't mean we know everybody everywhere. So again, you can email uh, us at industry, industry at .org with your suggestions. Um, in addition, uh, we're going to, each day is going to feature some sort of online showcase or virtual tour. Uh, these very well may be live streamed uh, or they will be live streamed, but we may make them uh, available to the public uh, in part to help promote tour guiding, you know, both locally with Tour Your Own City and also uh, with, um, you know, uh, visitors from out of town. Uh, and of course, the reason we chose the first week of May, other than the fact that it gives us time to work on the conference, that is also uh, National Tour Travel and Tourism Week. So, uh, which is always a good thing to try to promote uh, our segment of the tourism industry. Uh, and then the third day is going to be uh, what we're calling, well, we haven't really zoomed in on it yet, but hiring, networking, whatever, uh, get back to work day. Um, and this will take on components of our previous job fairs where we're gonna uh, hopefully have lots of uh, tour operators, both local and national and international. We're also going to be inviting uh, a lot of the OTAs uh, like Get Your Guide and Tours by Locals and Travel Curious and, and others uh, to meet with guides at that point, as well as invite uh, reservation technology companies like uh, Peak and Fair Harbor amongst many others so that you can really hone in on developing your own personal tour guide business uh, because that's kind of where the immediate future is going to be uh, in the guiding world in terms of um, kind of small groups and private tours and, and things like that. Um, so we are, like I said, we're just getting started on this. Uh, we will definitely be looking for input and I'm happy to um, to entertain any and all suggestions uh, in that regard. So stay tuned for that. Um, there might be a small fee to attend uh, the conference. Uh, we haven't fully decided on yet. Would not be uh, anything super expensive, uh, just to cover a couple of costs and also ensure that people actually show up if they register. Um, and uh, we also are looking into inviting uh, members of other tourist guide associations from around the US and maybe around the world. So. Uh, so that's uh, update number one. Update number two is something I'm really excited about. And for this, I'm going to share my screen with you guys. We are getting very close to, um, to uh, relaunching the industry partner page uh, for the Gannick website, which is going to allow us to, uh, I think I clicked on the wrong thing here. I'm in the circle of death at the moment. Um, but it, which will set us up for the next phase of really relaunching the industry partner program is, as many of you know, um, the industry partner program has seen a lot of organizations not renew. And that's really because there's not a great value prop. There hasn't been a great value proposition for them, uh, in the past. Um, and, uh, we're trying to make that more of a value proposition for them and also make a more of a value proposition for you. And unfortunately, I think I'm stuck right now and I'm not going to be able to share my screen. Uh, I don't know what's happening, but uh, in any event, uh, we're building it out. Some of the features that you will see when it launches, um, there is going to be a dedicated space behind uh, the Gannick login wall on each of the industry partners uh, profiles talking about the special offers that they offer to Gannick members. I know that has often been a complaint that uh, Gannick members have uh, mentioned about um, Gannick, uh, about the industry partner program, that there's no real way to consolidate that. So that's one phase. The other is um, 
the other phase is, uh, here, I'll stop my share. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll just, I think we'll just skip it for tonight. Um, and, uh, you'll have to be in suspense for next time. Um, is we're going to have a Mike, mapping feature. Sorry, Mike, do you want me to do it from mine? Um, no, because Oops. in its most initial stages. Okay, Thank you, fine. though. Um, the, uh, there'll also be a mapping feature so that when you're mapping out your tours, uh, you can see what industry partners are in certain areas so you can kind of incorporate them because the idea is for uh, companies to want to be industry partners of ours, we need GANIC members to patronize these companies. So, um, so stay tuned for that. It's, pr uh, we're pretty excited about it. Uh, Emma uh, for the IT committee and myself have been working pretty closely with Sam Cohen, our web developer uh, to, develop, uh, to develop that. And it's been a long time coming and it's, it's getting there. Um, last but not least, uh, we're starting to think about a spring relaunch for Tour Your Own City. Perhaps reshooting that intro video now that we understand more about COVID and uh, you know, we're not gonna do it all just like a extended Zoom meeting. Uh, but we're also looking again, as always for better ways to get the word out about this program. Uh, two suggestions that came from our committee were uh, hyper local media, not just in the five boroughs, but around the tri-state area and also local Facebook Fake, uh, Facebook groups for specific towns, as well as uh, targeting alumni associations uh, for colleges here in the US, um, uh, in New York City rather. Um, and so um, we have a couple other things uh, in the works there. We're always open for suggestions in that regard as well. So if you do have any uh, suggestions for that, again, email industryrelations at gannick.org. And I'm sorry about the screen share, but uh, like I said, we'll keep you in suspense till next month if it doesn't launch before that. So. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. And if anyone has questions, more specific questions for Mike, please just pop them in the chat. I mean, we will be able to see them. We can put them in the Q&A as well. Um, yeah, again, I see some people with their um, hands up. Um, Bob, but I saw you had asked a question in Q&A. Joe, you can put your question into Q&A or into the um, chat as well. So let me bring in Derek. Sorry, I just got caught up with something else. Um, Okay, so I'll bring in Derek and he'll give us an update on membership. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. So Derek, oh. take it away. Yep. Hello, everybody. It's Derek Chan, your membership committee chair. Um, I do, as usual, just want to uh, welcome everybody who is uh, joining us on this monthly membership meeting for the very first time, uh, where you are, um, well, especially if you've never joined us for the very first time. And for those of you who have been with us before, our longtime members, even our more recent members, uh, we're always glad to have you with us, even if we're not able to see you directly face to face. But one day we will be able to. I do want to uh, recognize our newest provisional member, Jay Hayes, recently became a new member. So welcome to Gannick. I do also want to welcome a new full member, Anne McDermott, who recently became a, a new full member on her first anniversary of being a provisional member. So welcome as a new member. So currently our active GANIC membership is 297. And if you were at our last meeting, uh, you will recognize that that is a decrease from uh, our previous meeting. And that's because we did go through our annual due cycle. So we did lose some of our members um, from that point. And just a reminder about that, for anybody who uh, is still wanting to renew your membership, you are able to do that throughout the year, in fact. Uh, but right now, there is no additional late fee for that. So if, um, if you're wanting to renew your membership, it's very easy to do that. You can just log into your Wild Apricot website uh, profile page and generate the invoice, pay online via that format. You can pay with a credit card, or if you also want to mail in a check, you're able to do that. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either the treasurer, uh, Jeremy Wilcox, or myself and the membership committee. Can we certainly help you out about that? Uh, also, as a reminder for our uh, current active members, there is a list of all the membership benefits on the website. You just have to make sure you log into the website. I'll put the, uh, the link in the chat. It's gannick.org slash benefits. That has a listing of things like um, the digital library, which uh, has been mentioned before, which has links to uh, the past virtual fam tours that have been recorded, past uh, PDPs, the personal um, professional development programs, and other information and resources that are of interest to tour guides, links to the social media pages, links to other 
um, and the Sure organizations. And as well as a link, if you're looking to purchase a GANIC guide name badge, the one that I'm wearing, many of our members have purchased them as well. We're continuing to accept uh, orders on a, on a rolling basis. We do have a, a good number right now, but we're looking to have some more before we actually place the order with the vendor. So if you wanna get into the next order, make sure to place your order. Information again is on the website, ganic.org slash benefits. If you have any other questions uh, for me or the committee, feel free to reach out. You can reach me via email at membership at gannick.org. Thank you. Great. Thank you very, very much, um, Derek. And welcome to Jay and congratulations to Anne for being a full member now. And um, it's really fun. And if you are here just um, to, to see what a GANIC meeting is like, of course, we welcome and we're always, um, we're still interviewing new members. We do that once a month. And so if you have um, friends or colleagues in the tour guiding world who are maybe curious about GANIC, please, please invite them to one of our online public meetings, have them check out the website, see the different benefits and things they can have for being a GANIC member. And um, yes, you can still you can still renew if you have not renewed yet. Um, uh, people can come to this meeting who have not renewed um, and uh, make sure you do. You know, we really, your membership dues go to sponsoring great GANIC um, membership events. So thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you very much for that. And um, we're going to move on to our final speaker, who will be Dave um, Gardner, who will be speaking about the newsletter. So thanks again, Derek, and welcome, Dave. So he should be coming in. There we are. All right, so take it away, Dave. Hello, good evening, everybody. Hey, Dave. Yep, yeah, we can hear you. Ah, oh, great. Hello. Uh, camera on? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. nope. Camera's not on. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Dave, and I'm your humble servant, your editor of the newsletter guidelines. And yes, even in this time, we have come through with a nice full-sized edition of our newsletter. So. Here it is, everybody. And um, as you I got see, mine today. Excellent. Great. And uh, Jeremy, of course, posted that he got his. So everybody that's waiting for him, you know, this is a crazy time, especially with the snowstorm, but they're in the works and in the mail. If you now getting them is not for everybody. Some people choose not to get them. You don't, they're not automatic, but you can receive yours anytime. Mike Grant got us too. Well done. And so if you would like to be on our list, there is, uh, I'll send in a moment, but there's an email to send away for and also to contribute. And since I know you're going to ask, the deadline for the next one is going to be Saturday, April 3rd, the day that Eddie Murphy turns 60, New Yorker, born in Brooklyn. And uh, so, uh, let me bring up this email here. I'm working on it. But uh, anyway, and if anybody's interested, we also have a book. And if you'd like to review it for the next one, it's available. So if you're interested, just uh, contact us. So, uh, and of course, the color edition will be um, on the website too in due time. But yes, it's out. We, of course, Emma's usual column and everybody else who kicked in. So well done, everybody. Great. So yeah, so like, like, thank you so much, Dave. Thank you so much. And like um, Dave said, if you want to contribute a column to guidelines, um, contact newsletter at gannic.org and you're welcome to have um, reviews. What is the book that you're looking to have reviewed, Dave? I'm sorry, you held it up, but I didn't see the title. I purposely did the back of it. It's uh, Tudor City. It was uh, just a thing uh, sent to us, uh, just a good New York type thing. So uh, whoever's interested, uh, uh, contact me, we'll figure out a way for the switch off and I'll get it to you and we'll hopefully you can fry it up for the uh, next newsletter. That sounds great. That sounds great. And in fact, yeah, the, the latest newsletter does have um, so two book reviews in it, um, which are definitely, definitely worth a look see. So From Linda, uh, yeah. yeah, and it's and if you don't get your if you don't get your hard copy, you can um, you can also find it online. Oh, yes. Uh, Mark Landman wants to know who is uh, the is there still um, the on a personal note 
in the newsletter? And who is our current Yenta? Uh, on a personal note, well, that's been a little quiet. So there have been bits peppered here. I sort of found myself blundering into it myself, but just as little things. Uh, well, uh, I guess as you could say, it's um, uh, our newsletter, our uh, personal note man's been a little quiet uh, recently, but uh, hopefully when we're, when we haven't ground to a halt, we'll have more things and events uh, worth uh, printing and all. Uh, yeah. Yenta. Well, I, th I think, and I think if anyone has good, you know, fun, special news, we'd love to hear it and we would love to, to write about it or have you write about it. You know, we, we, you know, we need, we need good news. You know, good news is, is good news. We want to have some of that. So, yeah. Right. And not just good news. Yes. You know, graduations, birthdays, but you know, if there's a death in the family or a, an event and that's, you know, a personal note. So, you know, just everything about yourself. So if you're got something to say, maybe if you have a kid or a grandkid who did something amazing, you know, write that in too. And by the way, I should also mention Linda Fisher specifically because she really came through as she always did. And, you know, she's got the business end of it and she just really, uh, she helps to, uh, to make this what it is. Great, yes, of course kudos and applause to Linda Fisher and to you, Dave, for getting this out. And, you know, the, the presses never stop. You know, this is wonderful. We still get our um, guidelines. And these, these things that continue, I think, are really, really important just for, you know, for everybody's morale to make sure, you know, we're, we're still there and it shows that Gannick is still running. So thank you very much, Dave. And I think, yes, there, um, the link to the past issues of guidelines, Derek, thank you very much for putting that in. Um, it's on the, um, you can get through the benefits link. You can also find it in the documents. If you just go into, if you're logged onto the Gannick website, you go into the members menu, that gray box, you'll find it under the um, documents and you can find it, you can find it right there. So yes, thank you, Dave. Thank Thank you very much, Linda. Yes, and you, did you have anything else, David? To, oh, to... well, just that Nina wrote in and just uh, Nina still has things for us too. And, you know, even in this time, we're still coming through. So Nina's yeah. column is up and running. So you're welcome, Nina, and thank you. Yes, thank you, Nina. Thank you too. All right, and as Robin says, there is good news. Um, 12 days until pitchers and catchers. My bad news, Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, that means no more football, which is my thing. All right, anyway, so I'm going to put Dave into as an attendee. So that's really it for the um, for the meeting for our committee reports. If anyone has um, anything they'd like to add, John Semlak is here. He's just called in. He can um, get onto the onto the the screen this time. We're not quite sure why. Um, but if anyone has questions for members of the board, we're here to to answer them. Or you can just always email us. Anything anyone wants to bring up in chat, uh, feel free to write something in there if you have anything to bring to our attention. Oh yes, um, Kevin Lawrence. Anina mentioned that um, that there's the New York um, Tour Guide Book Club will be meeting on Sunday the 28th. Kevin, did you want to um, mention that? I can see, okay, let's bring Kevin on screen just for a moment or, or at least his voice on just for a moment. Hi hey. everyone. Uh, yeah, so we'll be meeting on February 28th at 4 p.m. And if you're, uh, yeah. we'll be discussing a biography of Henry Ward Beecher. Uh, so I'm sure we, I think one of our meetings, we actually were in the church uh, there in Brooklyn uh, recently. So uh, anyway, uh, if you're interested in that, I put in the chat my email, kglnyc at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to have you join us. I'll give you the Zoom link. And also you can join us on our Facebook page, the New York City Tour Guide Book Club. And I'll post that on the Gannick page as well. So hope to see you there on February 28th. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kevin. So yes, yeah, so thank you, everybody. Any other board members have anything they'd like to bring to, bring to people's attention? Otherwise, um, I think we're all I think we're all set. So uh, thank you all for attending once again. One of our um, 
one of our fun filled fact filled um, meetings. <laughs> I just like be able to see everybody. I know you're all out there. And so I'm sort of sending, you know, good vibrations through the screen. Kevin, bring yourself on for a second. I'll take a, a, a photo of our um, smiling faces. And so, all right, hold on. Let me just get this. And I'm sorry, guys, this is, I know it's super awkward and cringy. My kids are, are you know, they hate it when I do things like this. But anyway, so anyway, cheese and smiles from Gannick board members. So cheese, everybody. And thanks you guys so much for coming. Um, thank you everybody who's attended. If you missed anything for the meeting, we are um, going to be posting that. This comes onto our YouTube channel so everyone can keep an um, keep an eye open and relive the, the wonderful moments of today, okay? So thanks guys, and we will see you the next time. We will hopefully I'll see you all at the Good for Guides meeting. Then we have um, International Tourist Guide Day, and then of course the award ceremony. So please come to the award ceremony. You know, you can be all glam from the waist up. I'm in yoga pants right now it doesn't matter like matt posted his picture tuxedo top and no pants that can go too that can go too don't tell us if you do that but um you can you are welcome to okay all right so thank you guys have a wonderful wonderful evening stay safe and we'll see you at our next our next great event bye now